You're in the right place. Hello, I'm Dan Harris. Hi, and I'm Claudia Kostler. You're over here, over there. Hello, and welcome back to Over Here, Over There, a podcast that looks at how we see others and others see us in countries across the world. I'm Dan Harris, political and media commentator. And I'm Claudia Köstler, senior editor at the Süddeutsche Zeitung. Today, we have a very special episode for you. With us are Dirk and Sabina Steffens. Sabina is a filmmaker, director, science journalist, and biologist, and her husband, Dirk Steffens, is a television presenter, journalist, and science communicator. He is best known for his work in the field of nature and science documentaries. Dirk has hosted and contributed to various television programs, particularly those related to environmental conservation, wildlife, and natural history. He won't want us to say it, but you can think of him as the German David Attenborough. One of Dirk's most notable roles is as presenter of the popular German documentary series Terra X, which covers a wide range of topics related to science and the natural world. He has undertaken film expeditions to more than 120 countries on all continents for his formats. From 2008 to 2018, he represented the Republic of Palau in Germany as honorary consul. Dirk acts as German ambassador for the environmental organization WWF and the German section of the Jane Goodall Institute, whose founder he has been close friends with for many years. Dirk is recognized for his passion for nature and the environment, and he has played a significant role in raising awareness about environmental issues and the importance of preserving our planet. His engaging and informative presentations have made him a well-known figure, and he received awards, including recently the Bundesverdienstkreuz, the Cross of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany. Together with his partner, Sabina, he now has a new project on the go that is set to reach new dimensions in films, books, and social media. They dedicate themselves to the big issues to raise awareness how we can tackle environmental problems and protect our planet. But they do so not by depressing you further about all the bad things going on. They have traveled the world and found truly positive, unique, and unexpected ideas and solutions on how everyone can play their part without restrictions or limitations. The first of those big issues or topics is food, and the solutions the two have found are not only surprisingly easy for everyone to take on, and can not only save the planet, but also save you time and money too. So without further ado, let's get going as we think the rest of the world should know more about their work. Now over to Claudia to kick things off. Hello, everybody. Hello, Sabina and dear. Great to have you here. A very warm welcome to over here, over there. In your line of work, you have traveled the world. Um, Now you have dedicated your new big project with Geofilms to food, saying that we can save the world by eating right. But you're not talking about becoming a vegan, are you? No, we are not, Claudia. Um, And hello, Dan. Thank you for having us uh, on this uh, um, great podcast. And of course not. We do not have to become vegans, at least not all of us. Um, Eating vegan is a good idea if you just put your numbers together. It is the most ecological way of feeding the people. But food is so much more than just fill yourself up. You know, it's it's culture, it's tradition, it's part of your biography. Uh, you know, um, maybe maybe the way uh, your grandmother's the turkey for Thanksgiving or in Germany, it's uh, the Christmas uh, uh, um, goose uh, we enjoy. You know, it's, it, it's so deep into your personality, into your biography, you cannot just tell people what to eat and what not to eat. That's not our approach. Um, so eating vegan is one way to contribute for a better world, but it's not the only one. Yes. Uh, hello from me too. And uh, one for once, we are no vegans either. And also with our project, we wanted to address like a wide audience, you know, uh, we wanted to, wanted to reach everyone. And to become vegan is not a lifestyle that applies to everyone. And so it's it's much more, and also it's not so much the way the the things that we eat um, that matters most, so, but it's the way this food is produced globally, and that's what we were uh, interested in mostly. Mm-hmm. Okay, wow. And you you are a true power couple working together. Recently married, I should add. 
uh, working together on your <laughs> documentary. Yes, mm-hmm. congratulations Thank all you. around. Very happy. <laughs> uh, uh, you work together on documentaries as presenter and director. How did you come up with the idea to focus on food and the worldwide interconnections of what you have on your plate daily? Yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, Sabine is my director in in many ways in life. (laughs) (laughs) I wish. (laughs) What an insight! I like your I like your honesty. That's off topic. (laughs) And 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 and, uh, working on that topic uh, fits exactly to what I'm saying because um, she forced me to become a mountain biker. We we were we were actually really steaming up a mountain. You know, was really. physically uh, going to the edge and we were thinking about our next project and and uh because you know it's it's so urgent to change the way we treat nature on the planet and so we ask a very strange but very simple question what is the the biggest environmental problem on the planet is it cars is it planes is it power stations is it coal mining what is it and if you look at the numbers from a scientific point of view if you really look at the numbers um, the 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 leverage the, the best leverage if you really want to change something is not coal mining or car driving these are serious problems no doubt about that but the the biggest leverage is the production of food which was a, a surprising answer to us working on, in this field for 25 years um, and so we uh, started to do our research how is food produced what are the impacts on climate change on uh, the uh, extinction of species of the loss of bio- biodiversity of the consumption of energy and all these kind of stuff so yes uh, food the production of food is the, the the biggest ecological problem and if we agree that we are living in the world that has to change the approach to nature um, that is um, problem number one and if you want to solve your problems start with the biggest problem. okay Right. Environmental issues can sometimes be overwhelming and discouraging to the average person. I mean, some feel annoyed by the issues and demands of living a mindful and sustainable life because this often goes hand in hand with limitations and restrictions. Mm -hmm. Others feel rather powerless in the face of, you know, the size of the problems and the political and economic context that we're all facing nowadays. But how do you maintain hope and inspire optimism in your work? Then you're so right when you're saying that uh, the narrative, the storytelling of environmental protection is connected to um, thoughts of limitations, restrictions, uh, um, uh, rising taxes, uh, uh, higher prices for food in the supermarket. And I I claim myself guilty of being part of that uh, wrong storytelling. Um, Because if we are true and if we really look at the facts, protecting environment makes us, over the long run, healthier, happier, and uh, um, probably will uh, keep us alive much longer. So it's not, a, it's, it's not a story of limitations and restrictions. It's a story of joy and hope. And um, I think in my community, in my hood, so to say, of uh, the environmental people, we, we, we tend to always point on the negative aspects of destruction. And we, we should focus more um, on the positive aspects of environmental protection. And that is what we are trying to do here, because people are really overwhelmed, as you said, overwhelmed by all the bad news that, you know, if you switch on the radio, if you switch on your computer and read the news feeds, or, or even... Um, um, if you are more traditional, uh, your, your TV, you know, it's only bad news. And just imagine, you know, um, um, a, a football team, a soccer team that uh, is really uh, depressive and before the game even starts, uh, is sure that they have no chance and that they will lose. That's not the right mindset to solve problems. So the storytelling has to be positive. Yeah, and well, uh, being a science journalist for over 25 years, um, also our perspective of telling stories has, has changed. We you switches from being negative and alarmistic to now giving hope and giving a positive uh, outlook of what we can do and what the solutions are. And I think it, there's never been a better time to address these topics about preserving the planet and conservation because at least... Everyone now, like, talks, like, at least many people talk about uh, sustainability and, and, you know, decreasing their footprints in many ways. Mm -hmm. So 
I think the times are very good for solutions. Sounds very interesting and uh, very optimistic. But we all know that the world out there, um, there are, you know, some, some haters out there, negativity is out there. In your line of work, you've flown around in the world. Um, did you ever encounter that this attracts critics too? Of course, a thousand times. Uh, in, in the public discussion, that's a, that's a very uh, common way. If you do not want to listen to arguments or you don't want to listen to uh, um, the facts, you try to, uh, to put the one you're talking to in a bad light. You know, like you are flying around the world. Uh, that's bad for the climate. So you're not supposed to talk about environmental issues. Mm -hmm. That's a typical line of, uh, um, you know, of criticism. But let, let, let us look on the numbers. Again, because we are science journalists, you know what? Right now, we we have uh, the climate summit in Dubai. Um, just imagine a world where politicians cannot come together anymore to talk about the future of our planet. Just imagine a world where scientists cannot travel to the fields where they do their field work, where all the all the data comes from that we are um, putting to the base of, of our discussions. And just imagine a world uh, where nobody is traveling anymore. Um, the protected areas, you know, national parks and all these kind of stuff around the world, they count around 8 billion visitors a year. Just imagine what would happen to these protected areas if nobody would come anymore. So, and in, in the corona crisis, um, we could, for the first time ever, We could see what happens if people stop flying. In Africa, for example, it was not possible to pay all the rangers anymore. Um, the protected areas, you know, they, 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 their financial basis was destroyed. And so we had, uh, if, you, if you come to poaching or illegal deforestation, um, it was the worst time ever. So a world without traveling would surely be not a better world, but a worse one. I can relate to that. I love traveling and I felt sometimes bad when I booked a flight because I thought I'm damaging the environment with it, you know. So this is kind of an interesting conversation we now have. And um, I mean, I know many people dream of traveling to exotic places. Um, you do that for work, but it's not always that glamorous as it might seem, is it? I mean, um, did you encounter any challenges during your recent projects um, Where you're somewhere in a remote corner and uh, thinking, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, what am I doing here? Oh, I ask myself <laughs> that question every single day on an expedition. Because, you know, expeditions, um, are, um, it's fun to talk about them afterwards. But when you are in it, uh, it, it very often means suffering. It really often means really working hard. You know, you... All these mosquitoes around the globe that love me because they're, they're always trying to eat me alive. Um, <laughs> all, all the tropical diseases I was suffering. Once uh, some 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 meds in a, in a specialized hospital in Germany, they they, they had a T-shirt printed for me because I was their their client with the most unknown diseases. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> that's, that's part of the story as well. And what was the what was, was the worst? What was the worst that you had? I mean, uh, malaria um, or. Yeah. Yeah, I had malaria. I had a lot of uh, diuretic uh, uh, diseases, you know, uh, stomach and guts are always... Your lungs. Uh, yeah, I had an infection from vampire um, <sighs> uh, vampire yeah. bats in Venezuela. So my, my lung, there was fungus a, in the a, lung, a fungus right? in the lung and it was very difficult to, to get it out. It was a, the treatment felt like a kind of waterboarding. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yes, nice party talk, but... Afterwards, <laughs> right. in it, it's it's not so funny, and uh, mm. this, this job is never glamorous because there's nobody to applaud uh, when you're in the middle of the jungle. And and to, to come back to your question, um, for example, for this very production um, about uh, the production of food, we have been to Brazil in, in the conflict zone where indigenous people try to protect their traditional areas against the soy mafia, and I'm using the term mafia mm. um, uh, in, in full consciousness, you know, because they are killing people to take land away from them, and then they, they, they cut down the, the trees, and then they grow soy there, and that soy is sold, for example, to Germany, to sausage country, because we are feeding our pigs with that soy, 
and uh, um, that has so many bad impacts on climate and on human rights and everything you can can imagine. Um, and we were there, and we were stopped by the police uh, and by a segment of the police that is well known for being corrupt and uh, um, fighting indigenous people and environmental uh, um, forces. So, yes, there were very uh, dangerous situations, and we had to run. Uh, from 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 these people, sometimes it's threatening. It's not glamorous and it's not funny when you are there, but it gives a nice story afterward. Sabina, do you want to add to that? Any anything that you experienced as well? No, it just it just came to my mind. And when we were there, we were meeting a, an indigenous chief, and he told us about how he has been tortured and beaten and threatened. Uh, with murder and uh, his family has been threatened and he has to live in a in a secluded or um was heißt geheim secret place, place yeah. a hidden place so because he is really in danger just for trying to protect his people trying to protect his land and this like what the soy mafia is it's like an armed mob these people are dangerous and violent and they use their connections to the government also to just take away the land of people so we can grow soy there and feed our pigs and we can buy the cheap bratwurst. It, it's just um, things that you experience firsthand. It's, it's, very, it's a very different thing if you read about it or if you are there and actually it happens to you and you see these people. Yeah, and the guy with the gun in his hand uh, knocks at your window of the car, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. geez. Well, how about a positive story? Like, which country or, or location had the most surprisingly environmental story that completely changed your perception of that place? Oh, that's for sure Costa Rica. But maybe maybe Sabine should uh, should tell that story because she has worked as a researcher in the tropical rainforest for years for herself. So uh, you 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 can I think it, you really know what's happening there. I've uh, worked in Central America as a tropical ecologist. Yes, and. The, the country Costa Rica uh, is is a beautiful example like how um, governments can really make a change. It, uh, the story of Costa Rica is, in short, is they've depleted their forests, they cut down uh, their primary forests all over the country to make fast money. And in the in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and uh, Uh, they had a lot of uh, environmental problems uh, due to that, like floodings and horrible weather. And then uh, this, Costa Rica also is a biodiversity hotspot, and there have always been scientists there that were aware of that. And then in the 70s, the scientists alerted the government, say, here, this is going to hell. You have to change that. And then... Funny thing happened. The government listened to the scientists. Imagine. Yeah. What a crazy word. Isn't it? Is that? that really sounds like science fiction, that a government listen, listens really and follows that voice of scientists. And they made a lot of changes. And they now have over a quarter of the state under natural pro protection. And, and also they included, they did many things right in short. They um, integrated the, the native population. They put bonuses on how if you preserve your forest or your environment then you make uh, even money out of it so now they have a flourishing um, sustainable tourism they have really great protected areas and biodiversity is coming back on a big scale so yeah. that was positive and inspiring they put a price tag to nature and in a system where the market is everything that helps a lot That is a great way forward. Yeah, that it can actually go hand in hand, you know, preserving the nature, the environment, but still being uh, an economical powerhouse with it, you know, making use out of it, making people um, be able to make a living out of it. That's a great way forward. Talking about making a living, I mean... I always think that buying organic food is uh, like a good thing for the environment to, you know, keep things healthy and keep going. but. Just as we are talking, I mean, we are also, we are hearing about a rising cost of living. We talk about inflation, the gap between the rich and the poor are widening. How can you make your approach appealing in these circumstances to people around the world? Because not everybody can afford, you know, buying expensive, organically produced food. 
Yes, uh, that is true. And not everybody can afford to do that. Um, but a lot of people in our countries can. And uh, it's, it's pretty convenient to consider yourself being not so wealthy uh, if you are standing in the supermarket making your decision whether you buy the, the burger uh, patty or the bratwurst, uh, which has a, has a, uh, a bio certificate or not. Um, you know, and that makes a big difference because we had this example earlier. We were talking about that. Um, to feed our cattle, we use soy from Brazil. If you buy a, um, a burger patty or, or a sausage um, that has a, that has a green label on it, there is no rainforest cut down for that. So it's a very simple thing to learn. If it is there is a certificate on it, uh, rainforest is not cut down for that. That's number one. But on the long term, we have to think a little bit more complex because if I go to the supermarket today and buy a German sausage, that is pretty cheap. I'm happy because I saved money and I didn't have to spend a lot of money for my food. But I'm coming home and there comes uh, the letter from our tax administration or the bill from uh, the f with, with all the fees for the water I've used and stuff like that. You know, the, if you produce food in a cheap way, in a not sustainable way, Over the long run, you have a lot of costs for repairing nature, for cleaning groundwater, for reforestation and all these kind of stuff. And who's paying the bill for that? Of course, it's us, the taxpayers. So I buy my cheap bratwurst, but then I have, to, I have to pay very high taxes. And over the long run, we have to fix that. Things have to cost what they are really cost. That's very important. And we don't do that. We, we put money... In that system to make food cheap and then we are wondering why it becomes so expensive to repair nature afterwards so it's a vicious cycle in a way yeah oh yes talk about labels and labeling i mean gm has been listed for the last 10 or 20 years you see that label on a lot of packages and it's a very controversial issue in many countries over the past decade what stance do you take on gm foods as part of a healthy diet and And despite any ethical considerations, do you think GM food can help in the areas of the of the world where there is a where there's food scarcities or difficult agricultural conditions? Yeah, there was an up and down with with the discussion of GM. Even yeah. in in the science community, there was a, a, a time when everyone said no, it's no problem at all. Then there was a, um, you know there was a time when everyone says okay, uh, let's be careful with that. Um, I think the science is not clear yet, and so we have to be careful. Uh, um, we, we are not tending to. You don't want to want to um, follow any prejudices. So we, we we really have to be careful, and we have to wait what science says. So uh, here we have an open end to that discussion. How do you play it? I mean, as far as do you try to inform and be an educator, or are you an advocate or promoter of it, or you just try to say that, like like you just said, there, like, you want to see what the where the science leads you on this. Uh, how, how do you play it? You know, with governments and and, and other groups. Uh, with with the people, it's it's easy. We just give the facts, and we try to give the facts in a way that, that enables people um, to uh, draw their own conclusions. With politicians, it's much more complicated. <laughs> I'm invited to Berlin, uh, uh, where the German government sits, uh, from time to time to give some advice. And um, you know, my experience over all these years, um, they are listening to advice, they, they are nodding, they are smiling, uh, they give you the impression that they understand. And the next day when they have a press conference, they say another thing. And <laughs> that's my experience with politicians. It's a little bit frustrating, but of course we see all that uh, threats and even threats nowadays and, and the pressure and all the, um, the challenges our politicians are facing. So it is a difficult job. I don't want to do that job. Uh, all I can do is advice, giving, give some advice. And uh, yeah, but I think the people make the decisions in the end. And uh, in fact, every day you go to the supermarket and buy something It's it's a, it's a poll. It's it's like a vote. You know, you're, we are not only voting every four or five years, depending on the country you're living on, but you're voting every day by your consumption, by all the little decisions you do every day. What kind of paper you put in your printer in the office? Um, um, how how do you warm your apartment? Uh, what kind of uh, of uh, holiday trip will you book for next year? You know, what do you eat? How many meat? How is it produced? You have so many decisions every day. So um, everybody has power to be to participate in changing the world for better. So 
let's get personal. I mean, where and how do you shop exactly? Do you go to the local supermarket? Do you go to an organic food shop? Or, uh, I mean, people uh, sometimes tend to go to farm shops because it's locally produced. Uh, we're just an average working family with two kids, so we do whatever is uh, fast and easy. Yes, we do sometimes go to the local farm shop. We love it. We live in a village, but most of the time we just use the supermarket and try to buy organic whenever possible. We just use whatever is in easy reach. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, you know, it's, it doesn't help a lot. When uh, let's let's uh, put some uh, fantasy numbers. If if you can can rise the number of people buying only organic and farm shops from five to seven percent of the population, you've achieved something, no doubt about that. But that will not save the world. What you have to change is the mass consumption. So uh, there is the leverage. And if you go to the supermarket, you really can afford it. So whenever you have the possibility to decide uh, certified food or not. Do the right thing and use your common sense. You know, if you if you like mangoes and you buy um, mangoes from the Philippines that flew in with a plane every week freshly, uh, you don't have to read a science book to understand that that probably is not very environmental friendly. <laughs> common sense helps a lot. You're also addressing a big problem in the West, particularly with food waste and the inefficiency around that and obesity issues uh, and health concerns around overeating. I could add in the statistics here, but we all know that it's, it's a problem both uh, throughout the West as far as obesity is concerned. What countries need the most urgent help, and particularly with what you're advocating and, and providing? The countries that need the most help are the, the most educated and industrialized countries, because we are the ones throwing food away uh, for, for ridiculous reasons. Um, one number is important to know. From all the food we produce on planet Earth, from everything that is produced, we throw away one third. And if we could reduce that number, um, that would be the fastest and cheapest way contributing, saving the nature and saving our future on the planet. And of course, if you live in a developing country where infrastructure is a big problem, you lose maybe corn or, or wheat or whatever you produce um, in logistics because it's not that developed infrastructure is a problem. But in countries like the US, like the UK or Germany or France, um, that is not our issue. In Germany, and I think these numbers are more or less the same in, in, in all the other developed countries, nearly 60% of all edible food that, that, that ends up being thrown away um, is thrown away by us, by, by private households, you know, by us. Uh, it, it's not the farming industry. It's not the supermarkets. It's us. So managing your fridge in a smart way probably helps more to protect the environment than asking which kind of car are you driving. That is an important question too, but your fridge is the key. And the beauty of this, you can start now. Everyone can do it. And you even end up saving a lot of money <laughs> by doing so. Yeah, no restrictions, no limits, saving money and uh, eating the same things you have always eaten and you love to eat, but try to manage your fridge in another way. And actually, by working on this project, our life has changed. Mm -hmm. um, the way we, we saw things in our fridge, uh, even when we're in a restaurant, we always pack up the rest and have it as a snack next day and stuff like that. These are little things, but 8 billion people changing their attitude makes, um, from, many, from 8 billion little, little changes, it changes everything. You're listening to Over Here, Over There with your hosts, Dan Harris and Claudia Kussler, with our special guests, German TV broadcaster, scientist and journalist Dirk Steffens, and filmmaker, director, science journalist and biologist Sabina Steffens. And we're discussing their innovative work and how to save the planet through smarter and more efficient ways of food consumption and production. Dirk, you were raised in northern Germany, but now live in Bavaria, both of you, in, in the south near the Alps, which is internationally popular and known for its beauty and traditions. Do you see environmental problems there too? All around us. Uh, you know, um, every morning when we wake up from, actually from our bed, before we even uh, put one foot out of the bed, we can see the Alps through the window. And Germany is a country that will lose all its glaciers 
all its glaciers in a few years. We can count down the days already. Um, uh, in a few years from now on, um, Germany will be a country with no glaciers anymore. So we can see the problem every morning when we open our eyes. So sorry, Derek, when you say glaciers, you say ice caps or snow caps on the mountain. Snow caps, uh, uh, glaciers in, in, in the Alps. Yeah. Snow caps are more in the polar regions. And, and if you're talking about the glaciers in the Alps, uh, and they are melting away. And that causes several problems. Flooding in the uh, spring and winter time, uh, droughts in the summertime, because all these glaciers, these snow caps, are nothing but storages of water. And uh, uh, they store the water in wintertime and they give it bit by bit, piece by piece. Uh, they, they let it flow into the big rivers of Germany, you know, like, like uh, the, the Rhine, the for Rhine, example. For example mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important rivers here, here in Germany. And, and this water is very important for, for our farming industry. So you see the problems all around us. We are losing biodiversity. And the main reason for that is because we do industrial farming. The fields are so giant, so, so big, and there's just one plant sitting there. And we use a lot of pesticides to, to, uh, to kill all the little plants that are important for insects and stuff like that. We, we lost three-fourths uh, um, three of our flying insects, of our insects um, that are very important to, uh, to uh, pollinate all, all the important fruit we are eating. So, yes, we are surrounded, even in Bavaria, Idyllic looking, but uh, only on the surface. If you look a little bit deeper, the problems are everywhere. Well, just before you mentioned that there is kind of an easy solution, which sounded a bit to be uh, uh, almost too good to be true, to be honest. Um, we could do so much by just throwing away less food, by organizing our fridge better. Do you have an example how you do that on a day-to-day -day basis personally? Because, I mean... If I look in my fridge, I, I could rearrange things, but I would like to know, do you have an example? How can I personally do that better? Actually, yes. If you just plan a little ahead and shop less, you don't, you don't have to have the full fridge at all times. You just need to think a little more of what you will actually eat in the, past, in the next one or two days. That helps a lot. And yes, as you said, rearranging is actually a really good idea just to you know put in 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 the in the first front row of your fridge uh, things that should be eaten first and then uh you don't discover at the edge in the very last corner of the fridge oh you should have eaten this an, a week ago so that helps and yes we uh, reuse a lot of food nowadays and and As Dirk said, we, you know, when we go into a restaurant, we cannot finish the plate. Uh, we take it, we take yeah. it with us and we uh, start preparing food of food items that have already been on the plate once. So there's lots of ideas that help. And uh, um, even as a science journalist, I have to say, here is one case. Please ignore the numbers. Ignore the numbers that are printed on your food you buy in the supermarket. Oh, yeah. Um, um, There's a very funny, you know, we Germans, uh, the German language uh, is well known of being a little bit complicated because we put nouns together. We, we stick one noun to another noun to make things more precise. And so we, we create very long uh, words. Uh, one, one word I want to give to the world right now, and here is Mindesthaltbarkeitsdatum. Um, that is a very complicated noun, uh, and it says nothing but uh, best use before. Um, so English is, is very often so so much more precise and so much more to the point. <laughs> We could learn from that. So, and this Mindesthaltbarkeitsdatum is printed on every single food item you buy in the supermarket. And just from a scientific point of view, it is bullshit because this number only this date only says until this day the product looks, smells, and feels exactly like in the second when it left the producing the producing uh, facility but it doesn't mean you have to throw it away it doesn't mean it's rotten it doesn't mean you can't eat it anymore but this is what all people think and they throw it away and I, i'm just i'm just saying trust your senses your eyes your nose and your taste and as long as it's good it is good and you can eat it and that can change a lot And just let me add, it's, this sounds like a little bit like a household tip, but it's much more than that. If you 
if you stop wasting so much food, it's it's not only nice and cheap, but it helps the planet so much. It helps to take the pressure away of our agricultural areas. It helps to reduce greenhouse gases. It helps to reduce uh, the amount of pesticides or chemicals that we use and that we put into our soils. It just helps in so many ways. Like for our film project, we've done one big event in Berlin and Uh, saved eight million tons of water. Of yeah, um, yeah first it was uh, Lebensmittel. Yes, yeah, uh, food, food, food yeah. and prepared a meal for a thousand people. And we saved that day not only the eight tons of of uh, food, but only eight tons of uh, CO 2 emissions yeah. and 30 million tons of water. So just, I mean, it's really a big thing. It's not only Uh, uh, organize your fridge and you have a better household. It just really helps to make the world a little better. Yeah, it's a snowball effect in a good way. You know, it starts very, very, it's very small in the beginning, but uh, it can grow to a giant uh, size. And with the fridge and that just, just the savings that you can make, is there a, a ballpark figure that you would say for in Germany that if you do this, On a yearly basis, you could save X amount. That's a kind of a, a good message that from a consumer point of view. Yes. In, in the end, because uh, in Germany, we throw away 11 million tons of edible, of good food every year. And that equals uh, 11 million tons equals uh, a few uh, hundreds of million of euro every year we are spending for food. And for the household, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have, uh, I don't know the, the the average number of how much uh, um, uh, a German family spends for food per year. So I, I couldn't give you a number of 10% percent or something like that. But it's it's uh, it's what I read in a, in a scientific paper. It's more uh, than the inflation of the last year. So we 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 are we are all complaining about everything is getting more and more expensive. You could just cut that off by throwing away less food. There's something that's caught my uh, attention over the last uh, few months, you know, like in, in certain countries, I've seen it on YouTube and uh, various commercials on online in both in the US and uh, in, in certain parts of Europe, is where you have these protective covers uh, for food in your refrigerator, uh, some of plant origin, some using nanotechnology, you know, just to keep the, the fruit and the veg, you know, fresher for longer, uh, to increase the shelf life and reduce food wastes we're talking about what do you think of these these solutions it is a way but i would i would love to 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 hand over the word to to my wife because she has a phd in botanics and and she tends to wrap what what i found awkward in the beginning uh, everything in our fridge in in wet uh, uh, cloth and in wet paper and stuff like that to to keep it fresh uh. <laughs> well I have a degree in botany and actually you can uh, prolong a plant's life and let vegetables are plants more or less <laughs> uh, by, uh, by wrapping it in moist, uh, yeah, well, by keeping the moisture somehow, you know, sometimes I put it in a bag and put a little uh, wet uh, kitchen cloth in and yes, it helps to increase shelf life. But other than that, I'm no expert in... in yeah, we should try uh, that with ourselves as well. So <laughs> maybe then we, we should uh, start wrapping ourselves in moisture papers <laughs> and, and cloth. And if it helps with the plants, maybe it helps us as well. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Claudia. <laughs> You've mentioned the mango beforehand uh, that uh, keeps being flown into our uh, countries from exotic places. Um, when... Are you saying that when I do buy a mango, because I do have a craving for it sometimes, especially during winter times, and I want a little bit of a, of a kick or a vitamin C kick or whatever, is that all right as long as I don't uh, oversee it in my fridge and it keeps being rotten down there and I, in the end I have to throw it away? So Because basically, if I look in my kitchen, I mean, I do have coffee that comes from Peru or uh, the Blue Mountains in Kenya. I do have various foods that um, are more international than my heritage in a way, you know. So is that still all right as long as I can not th avoid throwing it away? 
Um, you're right. You know, when uh, when you have your coffee from Ethiopia, you have your chocolate from Peru, you have your steak from Argentina, you have your tomatoes from Spain, you have your mango from the Philippines, and I could go on for that forever now. You know, uh, that means... Uh, to make it a bit more punchy to understand what I'm talking about, um, if you go to the toilet, it's like, like, like a conference of the United Nations every <laughs> single time. <laughs> because, yeah, right. because our food is so international. It comes from everywhere. And uh, um, mostly we don't even know where it comes from and where it was produced. And that is exactly the problem. Um, because everything is so connected, um, your food is connecting yourself to the world and everything that is going on out there. And yes and no, you can feel bad about your mango from the Philippines, but no, you shouldn't avoid it all the time. Just one example, because I just did some re research on avocados. Avocados uh, consume a lot of water when you produce them and uh, um, rainforest in, in uh, Central America and in South America is cut down for, for avocado um, farming plantations. But if you skip buying it, you cut off the income source for many people, for millions of people in developing countries. So that's not responsible either. So what you have to do is you have to use your common sense. For example, buy avocados. Try to avoid avocados from Mexico because the, the drug cartels have taken over that business and uh, they are killing people and they are, they are pushing the entire industry in the wrong way. But from other countries and even um, especially when they are certified, please keep on buying an avocado or mango from time to time to keep that industry for that poor people in other countries alive. So use your common sense again. It's never a 100% yes or never a 100% no, because science is not that way. It's not that easy. And uh, if I may add this beautiful example of the apple, you know, uh, like I used to believe I would never, it's not sustainable, sustainable to buy an apple from New Zealand because I mean why Germany is a country with apple orchards everywhere we grow them uh, they are great but um, if you look at the ecological footprint the this has bilanz yeah the, the um, you know um, uh, we, we harvest in autumn here in Europe and then we have to store the apples in cool houses And that consumes a lot a, of energy. A lot of energy. And so if you look at the year, around April, May, it gets unsustainable to eat a German apple because it has used so much energy. And the next harvest is in September, August. So if you buy an apple from New Zealand from uh, April to May all summer long, it is in an ecological way, it's pretty smart and sustainable so there's no it's there's it's not black and white sometimes there's a little bit gray and that that why the rule is not eat regional but eat regional and seasonal because uh, that only if it comes together it makes sense what about new foods like insects and uh, uh, grasshoppers or worms or whatever do very you see tasty, a future very tasty. For that? <laughs> yeah we added a lot of them yes uh, i still have some in during the, the research no yeah. i mean uh, to be honest there is lots of ideas out there of new foods new protein sources and foods that are produced in a way that don't harm the environment m much i mean insects are a good example we've been in uganda where the seasonal um, cricket harvest is huge and they love this food but still i mean we germans won't switch to insects on a broad scale Scale. But uh, there's a lots of good ideas that uh, are thinking of insects as a new food for our um, cattle, yeah. cattle and now uh, yes. pigs for pigs and chicken, no? our our crop animals. How do you say? Yeah. And and also there's um, lots of new food items even from the sea. You can eat algae and all these um, new foods will uh, will play their part in mitigating the problem. But yeah. actually, the main problem still remains with agriculture. We need to change that uh, and then <laughs> end wasteless, and then we can save the yeah. world. We have to <laughs> modernize uh, uh, agriculture and we have to rethink our consumption. And we have to take into consideration what generations um, who lived uh, long before us already knew because there are some some new new the, technologies yeah there's new knowledge from science that only proves what what people 200 years ago 
already knew. So how, which plants you combine on a field to, to keep everything healthy, to reduce the, uh, the amount of pesticides you have to use. And that is very important. And new ideas, you, we have to be open for new ideas, like, like Sabine mentioned. Um, if you do not like to eat grasshoppers and worms, you don't have to. But in Germany, there's an industry trying to feed our pigs with it because um, we mentioned that earlier. N right now, we are cutting down rainforests in Brazil to feed German pigs or American pigs or, or British chicken or whatever. And we can stop it and, be and because there's a fly um, in, in, in a German research station and the worms eat our uh, bio Dump, dump stuff away or yes. you know or the, or food the waste, waste or the yes. food waste, the food yeah. waste. And, they, and then you can dry you can dry that little animals that insects and you can you can substitute uh, the soy from Brazil with this and so you save the rainforest uh, you use your food waste in a, in a uh, sensible way and you're really doing good and you can still have your burger or your German bratwurst uh, and you don't have to eat grasshoppers <laughs> <laughs> Well, you said it before that the consumer, every one of us, is doing a major uh, thing by uh, changing the habits, you know, on our daily lives without any sacrifices. If we can actually rearrange our fridges a bit, if we stop throwing away too much food, we can actually do a lot, every single person of us together. But what about politics and politicians? I mean, you did a documentary which was well received here in Germany. Do you think that this has the influence, the power to change the opinion of uh, politicians? And also you need the agricultural people on board. Do you think it has the, the power to change there as well? Or is it just us consumer people that need to be addressed? It's, a, it's again the question, uh, what's the best leverage? If you talk about farmer, farming people, you know, the farming families, what do they produce? They do not wake up in the morning uh, considering, oh, how can I destroy as much nature as possible today? That's, that's not their attitude. It's nobody's attitude. The thoughts they have, and these thoughts are good and, 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 and healthy thoughts, how can I run my farm? How can I earn some money with my work? And that is a good thought. And uh, so it's not about the farming industry because they only produce what they can sell. If you cannot sell a, a special type of corn or wheat or meat or whatever, you will not produce it because it would make sense. So the supermarkets, the distribution industry, uh, the big uh, um, um, the big chains, you know, like you, you, you have Costco in, in the US and, and Tesco in the UK, and uh, we have Edeka in Germany, just to name some of them. You have to talk to these guys because they are buying from the farming industry. That is a leverage. Consumption is a, is a leverage, of course, because the supermarket will not put into their shelves what they cannot sell. You, if they cannot earn money with it, they will stop selling it. And, and if they don't sell it, um, the farming industry will stop producing it. So that's a very clear chain. And that is where our power lies. Now talking about the politicians, um, it's not so much different because every time I talk to politicians, I know uh, we, we tend to say, and we love to say, because it's a little bit funny that all these people uh, that couldn't make it in real life uh, become politicians. But of course, it's that's just a joke. It's not the truth. The truth is, They are very smart and well-educated people out there, but they cannot do what the voters will not allow them to do. So um, we have to send clear signals to our politicians, please, we are ready for a change. Come on, go for it and uh, uh, be strong and tell us uh, what are our possibilities. And so, yes, it's again... It's us, you know, it's Mahatma Gandhi once said, if you want the world to change, you have to start with, it by, with yourself. And I think that's a very wise sentence. And what do you think that your new projects, geo projects of yours, what, what kind of impact do you think that will have or what do you hope it to have? First, we want to... Uh, We want to fill the gap. There's there's so many there's so many fights in our societies nowadays. In Germany, for example, I think it's the same in the UK and the US. It's the farming industry against uh, the environmental uh, people, and everybody is just fighting each other. And and we have to 
we have to develop more common sense, what is good for all of us. So, um, and so we are not pointing with our fingers at anyone because it's not one group or one person being guilty of what's going wrong. It's, we are all sitting in the same boat. And, and uh, considering that, uh, the solution can only be a solution that everybody can agree to. Because, you know, if you want to change a society and a democracy, you first have to convince the majority of people. The majority of people is the first step of changing society. And so we want to send positive uh, uh, messages to the people. And we, want tr we are trying to say to the people, stop fighting, <laughs> uh, uh, try to reconsider it and listen to all the others. That's very, very important. Well, that fits very well into this podcast, by the way, uh, over here, over there, because that's what we try to do. We try to break down barriers here. And having you and Sabina on uh, as a guest suits that objective perfectly. Sabina, you wanted to come in. Just, I'm just happy because I've, uh, we've been asked by some schools uh, if they could show this film in class because uh, they think it's so important. And uh, for me as a filmmaker, that's, uh, I, I really am I'm grateful that it is um, received so well. And it's especially not only for like educated or adult people. It's also fun to watch and, and even children can understand it. And, and that's, That's the beauty of it, like getting the real, the complex world problems and, and frame it so that even a child is entertained and uh, that that they can understand. So. Yeah, and add some fun. Um, yes. uh, you know, that's that's very important. I know <laughs> I know Germans are very well known worldwide for their sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> But, okay, Spot on. come on, come on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, give some hope. Give us a give us a second challenge. We're working on that. You're hysterical. You're you're. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it, no, it's, it's it's very very important that uh, uh, you do not blame people. And you know, a few million people have watched our documentary so far. And what Sabine just mentioned that that most of the people that approach us to give some some uh, feedback say what i like about that film and about the book uh, you're not blaming everyone you're giving hope and i think that that motivates so much more to try changing things uh, than blaming anybody because if you blame somebody uh, what would be the reaction they will they will start to defend their 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 actions in a way Because I do the same. If if Dan, if you would say, "Oh, you are, you're a really bad filmmaker," and everything you say is really dumb, I would be forced into a corner. You, you corner me with that, and so I have to fight back. And fighting each other doesn't solve the problem. Exactly, exactly. So no doom and gloom. Um, to sum up, we're talking about opening the eyes of the public. That it does not need to be costly. We don't need to fight it. That there, uh, there is no need for any sacrifices or restrictions to really make a difference for everyone, for a single person to change the world for the better. Is that right? Yes. And we have to, <laughs> and we have to, to limit the greed of uh, some international uh, corporations. You know, just one example. Um, Sabine and we, we flew to Saudi Arabia. And uh, as everybody probably knows, it's one of the driest countries on the planet. We are talking about a country with no river, not a single river. And there's no grass, nowhere, except in a park where you irrigate it uh, artificially. And in the middle of the Saudi Arabian desert, there is a dairy farm. And there are 50,000 milk cows in the middle of the desert with no water around, with no grass, nothing. And these cows produce approximately 800,000 liters of milk every day in the middle of the desert. And uh, big corporations like Danone from Europe are part of that business. So they own a part of, uh, of, of that business. And just imagine what it means from, uh, for the ecological footprint. They have to bring 1,300 tons of fresh feed for the cows to the middle of the desert. And that feed comes from America, from parts of Africa, from Europe, from other continents. And you have to transport it there to feed cows in the middle of the desert. That is how our international and industrial farming industry works. They, 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 of course, they look on their profits for their own company, but they do not take into consideration 
um, all the costs for the human society. And that is the thing we have to change. In your extensive travels, I mean, you must have been in the US uh, quite some uh, times, very often, I guess. Are there any specific topics that are concerning the U.S. with environmental issues? We are all together on this, uh, uh, Claudia, because, you know, if you look back on the history of farming industry, um, the British uh, uh, engineering added a lot of the modern, uh, of the, 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 the basics for the modern machines we are using in farming. Um, Germany, for example, attributed the, the, the artificial fertilizers we are using around the globe nowadays. And uh, the U.S., of course, is... Uh, in many ways, still the greatest country. Um, they they added uh, industrial farming of animals. Uh, there's a actually a funny story. It all started with a misunderstanding. I think it was in uh, Delaware, where in the 1920s or 30s, when uh, many people were pretty poor, um, it was uh, common to have so just some chicken in your backyard, um, mostly for the eggs, for using the eggs, and and not for producing meat. Uh, at that time, mostly chicken was only eaten when, um, yeah, the hens were too old to lay more eggs. So it was <laughs> not, not meat producing. And uh, there was one family, very typical for that time in Delaware, the Steelys. And uh, um, the housewife, uh, Cecil Steely, was in charge for taking care of that chicken flock. And uh, then she ordered, uh, I think, 50 new ones for the next year. And there was a misunderstanding uh, because uh, they delivered 500 instead of 50. And so uh, um, for reasons I don't know and uh, which are still a little bit uh, in the dark and in the fog, she decided to keep all these 500 chickens. And so they, they built up a shed, uh, which is still in a museum in Delaware nowadays, the first broiler house. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very funny story. And she managed to bring them over the winter. And then she sold uh, the 500 chicken or the surviving ones in the spring just for the meat of it. And that was the, the beginning of meat production through chicken. And, and nowadays, you know, uh, you have hundreds of millions of chicken produced in Delaware <laughs> and the U.S. every single year. And uh, the technology developed on the basics that we learn from Cecil Steely are still due nowadays in all the chicken farms around the world. And these kind of innovations very often come from the United States because uh, there the farming industry developed a lot of new technologies and to the good and to the bad. If you mention another thing, Sabine knows a lot of it, uh, of it when and, and the same time when the Steely started their chicken farming uh, in the Great Plains, and another industrial farming story took place, uh, which didn't in the, came out yes, that well. In the Midwest, uh, mm -hmm. One part of our film focuses on soil loss, which is actually a huge problem that we are facing. We are losing soil and arable land uh, due to wrong techniques in agriculture, due to climate change. And there's one sad and very, very uh, terrible example in the United States. Uh, you all have st heard the stories about the Dust Bowl. And what happened was that the Great Plains were in equilibrium for like hundreds thousands of years due to buffalo and grazing and prairie grass. But after the buffaloes were almost eradicated, they started intense agriculture there. And they had record uh, crops in the yields in the beginning. Like there was the corn source of the United States. But due to the industrial farming or the intense farming, the soil lost the natural protection of the prairie grass. And when drought and storms came, all this uh, loose soil was blown away and ended up in the air and around the buildings and suffocated the animals, covered the buildings, destroyed the farms. The whole dust bowl became a dust bowl <laughs> and millions uh, of people had to uh, abandon their land and uh, and flee from the land. So it was one of the greatest man-made catastrophes in history. Uh, so due to mostly wrong techniques in agriculture, the soil was lost and it and it's still it's difficult to get it back. Yeah, and that, that gives an example what you can do wrong. And and so to the good and to uh, the bad, it's uh, we can learn a lot from the United States, because the scale of industrial farming is so big there that you, you can see what happens maybe sometimes a little bit earlier than you might see it in Germany or the UK because we are smaller countries. 
Are your geofilms going to cover that area? Are you going to do the historical perspective on the Dust Bowl? Yes, and, yes, yes, yes. And yeah. bring it forward? Yeah. 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 And, and bring it up to yeah, today. We, we included and what, all what that be because, because it really shows, you know, just imagine the, the Great Plains and what we have done to that area as the entire planet. And that gives example. If cutting down the rainforest in Brazil is exactly the same story, just in another region of the world. You're Geofilm and book uh, Eat It are available on streaming platforms, uh, RTL Plus and via Penguin Books. Are there p any plans to have English-speaking versions of these? Yes, uh, we are working on it. Uh, um, we are working with our publishing house. Penguin, as you know, is I think it's the biggest publishing house uh, on the planet. So yes, we are working on an English version. And uh, with the film, we are in negotiations. Uh, it will take us some more time. So please be patient. Uh, we'll let you know. Maybe we can have you back on the program once it's been released. Yes. Yeah, pleasure. Okay. Well, thanks very much. We'll wrap it up there and say thanks to our special guests, Dirk and Sabina Steffens. Look out for their book, Eat It, uh, and their geo projects that are coming up. Good luck with all that. And we look forward to having you again with us to tell us more about the ecological food and sustainability efforts that you're, that you're pursuing. Before we close, we'd like to remind our listeners that they can subscribe to our podcast below, which can be found on most major platforms. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And today's podcast show notes can be found on our website, overhereoverthere.org. If you want to be a, a patron, we have a button for that too on our website, and we very much appreciate your support. Polite, insightful, and constructive comments are always welcome in any language. So check out our website for the next unmissable podcast. And until then, thank you for listening to Over Here, Over There. Oh,